In order not to make a fool of myself in this distinguished crowd of speakers, I have cheated. I ask Chat GPT, what is the least interesting question you could ask on a seminar on the theme of Eronos? And the answer that came up was, what is the weather like in the town where Jung was born? So you can, <laughs> you can be sure that is not a question that I will not ask. Uh, there have circulated rumors this morning that the Swedish Archbishop Nathan Sjö de Blom was related to Ernest. So I asked the, my friend Chat this qu a question about this. And I found out that Chat GPT is like a Jack Russell Terrier, very energetic and always keen to be pleasing to the surroundings. And they came up with a suggestion that Sir de Blum was a founding father, an active member of the conferences, and a great contributor to the yearbook. And he participated, says this Jack Russell Terrier, between 1933 and up to 1960. There's a slight problem in this because Sir the Blum died in 1931. So <laughs> this far I say, don't trust Chat GPT too much. It's a brilliant partner in a conversation, but it has no real knowledge. It's not really trustworthy. Preparing myself for this, I've come up with, with two, I think, basic questions. Is One is, are the 2020s similar to the 1920s? One participant at the Erinus conference described the 1920s as when the old dogmas of science, economic progress, belief and moral are once again shaking. So we can have that as a discussion. The other is, are scholars today as broad ranging as they were in the 1920s and 1930s? Do we have to do more bridging between hard science, humanities, religion and philosophy? So I just say Leif Witherby, welcome up on the stage. Uh, hi, thank you. And, uh, uh, yeah, so um, I promised to talk about organicism, which I think is one really important uh, f like interlocking phenomenon with the set of ideas that come together in Eranos. And I don't think there's any agreement on a name for what comes together in Eranos precisely, right? Um, except I really like that phrase that Wasserstrom has, which is religion after religion, as a super interesting phrase. It may come up, up again. But I promised to talk about organicism, so I wanted to say first what what could we say organicism is? I tend to think of organicism as the use of a metaphor that comes from the sciences of life to apply to some other area. So not the model of life itself, but the use of some idea within life to describe, say, society as such. Society hangs together like an animal body, right? The part and the whole mutually influence one another. Or the mind, for example, is often characterized in this way. And what I want to say today, just to, to sum it up at the beginning before, before moving into the details, is that there is a convergence of models of life and systems of representation in two separate moments, and Eranos is kind of involved with both of them in an interesting way. So the first one, which you could call romantic organicism, happens around 1800. And there's a, there's a kind of, like I say, a convergence between what eventually becomes called biology. The term doesn't emerge until just about the year 1800. And then it's serially coined like five or six different times within about three years. And what we would call modern epistemology, I guess. I don't, there's no other word for this except idealism, basically, German idealism. And then the other time when systems of life and systems of representation come together in this sort of super productive way is around the Second World War in the 1940s, out of which then emerges the computer revolution. So ChatGPT somehow has, comes from that, right? But, uh, and in that case, there's a sort of more complex convergence, which maybe I'll describe just as we go along. But um, what, they what they share, these two focuses, uh, these two convergences of life and representation is a notion of the symbol. And the notion of the symbol then, I think, gets picked up by Eranos uh, 
just before the point of convergence at which you see the digital revolution emerge. So that's what I want to say today. And, and uh, I want to take, uh, there's I have a, a quote from Henri Corbin here, in which he is adopting Jung's notion of the active imagination, which I think this crowd knows uh, Jung used to sort of explore his own psychopathology in, in one part of his life. Corbin says, the active imagination will function directly as a faculty and an organ just as real as, if not more real than the sense organs. The organ is not a sensory faculty, but an archetype image, and the property of this image will be precisely that of affecting the transmutation of sensory data to restore them as symbols to be deciphered. It changes, it, the act of imagination changes the physical datum impressed upon the senses in a pure mirror or a spiritual transparency. And I, I picked this quote out of the reading that I did before this because I think it is truly extraordinary and you can see all of the different influences converging in the same place in this quote. The idea, first of all, that whatever is religion comes out of sensory experience in this way but then is transmuted and is transmuted by something that is an organ and so has this kind of organicist idea but is not a sense organ. This is an idea that at the very latest I would place in the middle of the 18th century with Lessing because it is Lessing who in this extraordinary piece called uh, that there can be more than five senses for the human seems to first pick up the idea of their electricity, but it is quickly spreads to other ideas of feeling and sense organs that would be outside the sense organs. So there's this reaching back into that early place. And I want to say that this is consonant, I think, with, we know that the other, other than Jung, the major influence on the, on the early group was Rudolf Otto, right? And Otto's idea of the numinous is a non-conceptual experience which is also concrete and can be somehow is, you know, connected to symbols in the same way. So we get the idea of aesthetics. <laughs> and in Romanticism, aesthetics and this idea of organ or organicism come together in this really strong way. So I want to propose my two series of convergence, and I'm going to do this a little bit telegraphically, so I can, we can talk about any of this that you like, but I want to propose this in two larger narrative arcs. So the first one is, they both take about a century. When you look at 1800, you're really looking at the period from about 1685 to about 1815. And when you look at the birth of the digital around 19, let's say 36 to 53, you're looking at something that comes from the 1860s and 70s. Newton creates a vacuum. He, he proposes these laws. It's, it's massively influential, but there is an explicit search for then a century that eventually results in biology for a Newtonian style or a, the possibility of a set of laws that would apply to life. And it's at the end of that search that we see the emergence of the thing that is called German idealism, which is connected to these, these uh, to, to those precise uh, um, developments in uh, searching for a concept of life. And I would just note two things that I think are super important here. One is that Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi, who causes this major stir in Germany called the pantheism controversy by saying that Lessing was a pantheist, that he was a Spinozist. He believed that nature and God were one. If you look to the positive side of what Jacobi says, he says, where is the experience of God? It is in nature, actually, or it is rather through nature that one realizes. And what he emphasizes is, in rational philosophy of all kinds, Hume and Kant are his two thinkers. He says there's a chain of reasons, and the chain is interlocking, and it is unbroken, and it is mechanical, and it cannot be broken. And then he says, but the chain is not, there's nothing underneath it. It doesn't support itself. And when you look at it that way, in this sort of sense of totality, you suddenly break through in what he calls a mortal leap. It's a metaphor and a phrase, the salto mortale, picked up by Kierkegaard later, that is the essence of religious experience. This idea is then combined with the organ idea by Schleiermacher, major influence on Otto, who says, metaphysics makes the universe into an infinite depiction of the human Religion lives in the infinite nature of the one and all, that is, the pantheistic continuity. So there's this kind of interesting convergence within this idea of the organ, the idea of the whole, and then the idea of an experience which is sort of an idea of 
an experience of everything all at once somehow that comes together around 1800. The Aranos group reaches back to this all the time. So the major uh, moments that I would just like to, to mention in, in which they reach back to it, uh, Sholem picking up shelling and the positive philosophy of mythology that, come, that comes directly out of this, this combination of things. Um, uh, as I say, Otto with Schleiermacher and uh, I think Corbin as well, although someone who knows more about Corbin will have to say more about it. Um, the second larger narrative arc and which is in the middle of convergence when Aranos is in its first heyday is that of, let's say, if Newton emptied out the universe using a series of laws, so did statistical physics. Once statistics was introduced by James Clerk Maxwell into physics and thermodynamics emerged, the universe looked sort of weirdly empty again and the question of what sort of systems existed in it became a very active question. And the question of those systems became a question of life and we can trace uh, uh, the rise of the, that notion of, of life as a, a system that guards its own borders from Claude Bernard's thinking of a, an interior milieu of life to Uxkill to even to Watson and Crick. It eventually goes all the way, of course, to the modern synthesis of biology, but we can see that that is the notion of homeostasis too in Walter Cannon's work these systems of life are intimately related all the way through to problems of what eventually becomes called information. And which here we can just, I just said at the beginning, like another system of representation or a way of thinking of a system of representation. So as that convergence occurs and comes together in one point in digital technologies, we see that the thinkers who are working in this area are forced to reintroduce Aristotelian terms into their thinking. And so Hans Trisch, who's in the handout there in the, the booklet, reintroduces the notion of an entelechy. The cybernetics group reintroduces teleology, and then uh, Funder tells them, stop saying teleology and we'll never give you any money, and so they drop the term. <laughs> but everything converges around the problem of a goal orientation, and what allows for goal orientation, or feedback as it's called, is symbols, information. And, but it's not really called the information yet. So if we go back to this Corbin quote about the extra non-sensory organ, right? We can see that this organ exceeds the senses but also faithfully transmits something to the senses, which they don't capture, but then we're sort of exposed to this, in the, we're sort of in the grasp of this reality, right? And it relates, this comes directly out of Jacobi. So what I'm proposing is that in a moment like that, Corbin is reaching back to this convergence around 1800 to deal with what is an unfinished convergence around whatever, 19, in the 1930s and 40s. The problem that emerges is the problem of totality and the symbol. The information problem, which arises from the organicism complex, is also about totality and the issue of a complex meaning that isn't captured by human logic or human sense. And so the sense of the term symbol, which is always related to an organic model, it really has been since at least the 18th century, is captured like as something numinous in Otto's terms, but which it, in which it is extremely difficult to see the difference between what we today might call like an inhuman or an alien form of knowledge, maybe even one that is captured by AI systems or something like that, and a religious experience of otherness, the absolutely other that, that Otto puts uh, onto that term. So infinity and totality are these terms that emerge from the organ representation interface, is what I'm trying to say. And they do that at least twice. And if Aranos is in fact religion after religion, I, again, I like Wasserstrom's term, then I would like to propose that this is because Aranos situated religious experience in this interface between the organ and the representation. So right in the moment where we have to ask ourselves, where is the line between a physical system, a living system, and a knowledge system? I'm gonna just leave that as a provocation at the beginning of all of this, and yeah, and yeah, great, yeah, great. We have, we have time. Oh, we have time. <laughs>
Please repeat your last sentence. Uh, I want to remember it. The idea is just that, that the Aranos group, that can boil all of that down, <laughs> that the Aranos group uh, situates religious experience at this triple interface, which is super important in early, mid 20th century, like knowledge production as such, which is the problem of where does a physical system differentiate itself from a living system? Where does the living system differentiate itself from a knowledge or a representation system? Mm -hmm. And how are the three all combined, basically? And that is yeah. organicism, in a way. Yeah, I think the, the organicist idea of how those systems might relate is one sort of very important, Drish is a very important example of that. It's not the only one. But there tends to be, when the word symbol is used to capture that, there tends mm -hmm. to be this sense of those things are not hanging together mechanically. They're not juxtaposed with one another. They're somehow bound together where part and whole mu mutually influence one another or something like that. Yeah. But is this yeah. idea of organicism applied today in, in research and, and science? Usually not, <laughs> I would say. Um, part of the modern synthesis seems to be or at least is self-understood, I, maybe I shouldn't overstate that, but the, there's a sense in which biology tries to let go of organicism in a mm. strong sense and to explain life without recourse to any of those Aristotelian yeah. terms or something along those lines. But I would mention there's this super interesting uh, book on the history of automata and biology by Jessica Riskin. Yeah. And she makes a, a very compelling case that something like an organic model resists the Darwinian and every other mechanical or serial notion of how life emerges and keeps popping up at, at sort of almost strategically yeah. placed moments in history. Yeah. So it, it, it definitely still plays a role. Yeah. I, I yeah. imagine it could play a role in bridging the gap in the debate on climate change. You uh, have on one hand the geoengineers who think you can manipulate weather and, and the earth itself. And on the other hand, the ecologists who revert Gaia as a kind of living world organism. Yeah. So could this idea be a bridge? Yeah, may maybe. I mean, I think that's absolutely, I mean, the Gaia hypothesis, as Margulies and um, Lovelock first wrote it, uh, involves the idea that there is a kind of self-regulate, that there is like a border guarding, there's like some sort of patrolling of the system mm -hmm. that is internal to the principle of Earth itself and its atmosphere. and. Um, there's a chapter on cybernetics in the guy in the in the book version, which Lovelock wrote, and uh, and I think that it's that that those that type of model definitely exists in that sense. Uh, I mean, for for me, it won't solve any major problems because the main problems to do with climate change are informational ones. Mm -hmm. We have a massive amount of data and a lack of of ability to use the information to do anything at the level of the system that we need to do something at. So when we look at geoengineering solutions, I've been reading a novel in which the idea is that we use sulfur, we shoot sulfur into the stratosphere in order to remove the carbon from it, right? Mm. And this cools the temperature of the earth. And even if you dislike that idea, if you come from the greens or from something like the Gaia hypothesis or something like that, it still seems utopian because we can't seem to get anything like off the ground in, at, at the level of the system which is actually affected, which is mm. the whole earth, right? Leif, thank you this far, and welcome back to our panel discussion. We have more things to discuss. <laughs> our next speaker is Robert Brain. Welcome to Engelsberg. Welcome to the podium. Thank you. Uh, in Memories, Dreams and Reflections, Carl Jung described a moment around the age of 19 in which he struggled to decide between a career in the science, sciences or the, or the humanities. He experienced two dreams which helped him resolve the dilemma. It's the second one that interests me, uh, interests me here. He says, I was in a wood. I, 
it was threaded with watercourses, and in the darkest place, I saw a circular pool, surrounded by dense undergrowth. Half immersed in the water lay the strangest and most wonderful creature, a round animal shimmering in opalescent hues and consisting of innumerable little cells, and so on. It was a giant radiolaurin, measuring about a meter across. It seemed to me indescribably wonderful that this magnificent creature should be lying there undisturbed in this hidden place. It aroused in me an intense desire for knowledge so that I woke with a beating heart. He goes on to say, these two dreams des decided me overwhelmingly in favor of science and removed all doubts. Now, it's a curious thing that Jung, after writing after his scientific education, confused the species. But that's another question. It doesn't interest me. It's not important here. What is important is that th these two images are from the work of the German Darwinian biologist Ernst Haeckel. So today I want to talk about Darwinism and more precisely the most popular form of Darwinism around the turn of the 20th century, Haeckel's evolutionary monism. And it might surprise some to hear that Darwinism was more readily embraced by scientists, the media, and popular culture in Germany than in other European countries. And it was the German form of Darwinism that, prov that, served, uh, that proved most influential among educated cosmopolitan European publics before the First World War. Darwin himself saw this uh, coming in terms of 1861. He looked to Germany uh, to, uh, to promote his ideas. Um, um, and in fact, it, this, this largely happened. Darwinism quickly became a part of the prolific coverage of natural history and popular periodicals, whose outlook was broadly based on uh, Alexander von Humboldt's biogeography with nods to Goethe's aesthetics of nature. Now, the man behind this German Darwinismus explosion um, was the University of Jena zoology professor Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel's influence was pr pr prodigious. He was probably the most famous scientist in the world uh, in the years before the First World War. Um, he read Darwin's Origin of Species in 1860 and immediately became a lifelong supporter of the English naturalist. Here he is in 1860. So today I'd like to talk about uh, his, uh, his ideas. The, Dar his, Heckel's Darwinis Darwinism featured significant differences from Darwin's own precepts, and over the course of his lifetime, Heckel migrated away from Darwin's core concerns in many respects. By the 1890s, Heckel advanced a sacred pantheism with a monistic message of world unity based on the indestructible presence of force and matter. And Heckel and his followers promoted a re-enchantment of nature that would both redress the alienating effects of professional scientific specialization and challenge bleak visions of evolution that emphasize competition, struggle, and death. <clears throat> and his later publications, Heckel also emphasized aesthetic concerns, celebrating natural beauty as a central component of his monist creed. Heckel described nature itself as an artist, and here's a book with that very title, uh, Nature as, a, as Artist. Um, arguing that it was therefore best understood, since nature was an artist, nature was best understood in aesthetic terms. And so his later works provided sumptuous color illustrations, primarily of microscopic and marine creatures that offered visual proofs of evolution and were intended for adaptation by artists and architects. Many took up Heckel's invitation and incorporated his iconography in Jugendstil and Art Nouveau and Lebensreform, Art and Architecture, all of which was inescapable around the turn of the century. Heckel's own images and art inspired, and the art inspired by it, served as a gateway to his evolutionary monism. The images didactically evoked the very principles through which na living nature functioned. So Heckel's vision of life is, is involved and complex, but it can be summarized as follows. At no point did God create anything, whether inorganic or organic. All is originated through an incessant progressive process leading from the simplest to the most complex organic matter. Um, uh, organic matter originated from inorganic matter through spontaneous generation, a process called Entwicklungsgeschichte, developmental history. And in this process, lower living forms start from a simple cell 
and follow a long evolutionary path leading to higher forms. And this process of life in its increasing interest, in, intricacy can be best represented in the branching forms of the tree. So these familiar tree diagrams are Heckel's invention. This is one of the human lineage, it begins with single-celled uh, uh, organisms, the Monere, and ends up with mention with humans um, at the very top. And here's another tree predicting a, uh, depicting a wider animal kingdom. Heckel's stem trees, as these are called, also illustrated what he took to be a fundamental law of evolution, the biogenetic law, um, the, the idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that is, every living form travels in its embryological development, that's ontogeny, through stages which resemble, which recapitulate, in fact, the stages through which the group to which the animal belongs itself went through in the course of evolution. So the highest forms are nothing but the lower forms, which in their history have grown to their highest position in the tree of life. It's a new version of Lamarck's transformism. So a worm follows an evolutionary path which takes it to higher and higher forms, human beings being, of course, the highest in their most elevated aspect, educated humans. So we can conclude that a German professor is little more than an advanced, progressed worm. <laughs> a key element of Heckel's biology was his theory of heredity, um, which directly challenged Darwin's theory, the only part of Darwin's theory with which I disagree, Heckel wrote. In contrast to Darwin's corpuscular theory, Heckel proposed a wave theory uh, rooted in cellular protoplasm. So protoplasm, um, and this joins the concept of energy with evolution. Protoplasm found in every cell and every organism could receive and store vibrational forces and in turn communicate them horizontally to other cells and vertically to, uh, to offspring. Heckel's protoplasm theory was, was really an extension of a theory of organic memory uh, proposed by uh, the German um, biologist Ewald Hering in a much-discussed speculative essay, Memory as a Universal Function of Organized Matter, uh, published in 1870. Hering suggested that there are close connections between the conscious memory of ordinary life and the phylogenetic memory transmitted through the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Both were to be attributed to the effects of vibrations imparted to the organism from external objects, vibrations that were repeated enough passed from conscious memory to the unconscious inheritance of organisms, so into the, an unconscious inheritance that's shared by all biological life. And Her Herring insisted that the memory of living, mat living matter must be continuous from the early ex existence of protoplasmic organisms to the present day. And so though individuals die, the memory of living matter is carried on. <clears throat> so Heckel's idea schematizes this through this wave theory, and he has a kind of, a kind of mechanistic wave theory model of how, this, uh, how Herring's uh, organic memory is transmitted. I won't go into it, but it's important because I, I want to call attention to it because it's in this wave theory. It's very, very fundamental. It's a, it's a dynamic vibrational wave theory, and he argues that, in fact, this, the, all of these, um, uh, these tree diagrams are essentially depictions of a wave. So what looks static in these pictures is actually a shimmering, ramified wave that courses through all organisms and through the entire history of organisms. And this wave theory is really what gets translated into the visual languages of Jugendstil and Art Nouveau. So all of this kind of shimmering, kind of organic waves, which are the bearers of this kind of organic memory. So, so that when you're seeing this, you're actually being kind of brought into this kind of waveform doctrine, and Heckel's ideas are very specifically included in these very very universal forms of art around the turn of the century, architecture, the famous tassel house, and, and so on. One last bit about Heckel. Um, although his work um, emphasized aspects of knowledge that suggested a unity he believed to underlie the su superficial diversity of things, Heckel called this view of unity monism, a term that he coined in contrast to dualist conceptions which post postulated gaps or oppositions in the explanation of reality in all of its aspects. Heckel's monism became a real philosophy, a theology, and an ideology. Um, dispenses with the Christian God, but it's not an atheism. It's a, an idea of the unity of God and nature in a conception reminiscent of Spinoza's pantheism. Um, no dualism, no divine creation, no afterlife. 
um, just the eternal existence of force and matter in incessant change. Um, so individuals were the ephemeral means for the maintenance of force and matter um, and into the internal substance of the universe from which they would return from here to eternity. So monism was thus a kind of spiritualized nature and a spirituality uh, naturalized, and it appealed to a great many people in the early 20th century. Well, let me conclude with some thoughts um, about Jung and Heckel, where we began. There are, I think, some important overlaps between the heckle herring um, organic memory and Jung's conception of the collective unconscious, a similar belief in the continuity of consciousness in which the individual is but an episode. Here's Jung, 1927. This whole psychic organism corresponds exactly to the body, which, through individu which though individually varied, is in all essential features a specifically human body which all men have. In its development and structure, it still preserves elements that connect it with the invertebrates and ultimately with the protozoa. Theoretically, it should be possible to peel the collective unconscious layer by layer until we come to the psychology of the worm and even of the amoeba. Jung also says, consciousness is an interval in the continuous psychic, psychic process. So in the same way that species, individuals are also intervals, they're temporary placeholders in this kind of, in this, um, in this continual process. He also describes, says, the whole spiritual heritage of mankind's evolution is born anew in the brain structure of every individual. So what I think is important here is that Herring and Heckel emphasize the persistence of a mostly unconscious organic memory, which an individual occasionally encounters. For Jung, the focus is on the individual, um, who fills in the gaps of consciousness with the collective unconscious, and more specifically, who had a kind of spiritual and biological need to repair the fragmented and distorted expression of the collective un unconscious in their life. So there's a shift from the, from the unconscious as the focus to the individual and the path and the reconciliation of these two. Heckel's a 19th century man, kind of comfortable, untroubled by kind of progress, Jung, a 20th century man, troubled, dealing with a broken world, and focused on the individual's relationship to this, to this heritage. Um, so, and therefore the needs of analytic psychology, I Ching, yoga, Eranos, all the modes of the journey of the soul uh, explored at the Eranos conferences to make the individual aware of his or her relationship with the collective unconscious. Did I make it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this presentation in Eronos, the spirit of Eronos. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Darwin is always with us. Heckel was for some time forgotten, and I think there's now a renewed interest mm -hmm. in him. Yes. Why this renewed interest? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I don't know what it is, if there's something in the zeitgeist that, that, uh, that conditions it. Um, some of the reasons, I mean, the, the mid 20th century turns and recovery of a kind of what, Dar what the so-called Darwinian synthesis takes everything away. And there's a kind of, what I would call a kind of fundamentalist Darwinism that, that arises and a kind of materialist biology that, that gave Shekel, Heckel a shame face. There's also a kind of sort of terrible kind of misreading that labeled Heckel quite inaccurately as an anti-Semite and a precursor of Nazism. Really, this is really quite wrong uh, reasons I could go into. Um, but I think that steered some people away um, and people have realized that, that's, that, that that was simply erroneous. Uh, so there, there, there are a number of kind of different kinds of reasons, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I think those are some of the main ones. You say he, he viewed nature in a, as from an aesthetic perspective. Yes. Why is this a useful idea today? Well, um, it's interesting. There are people doing uh, informational work. I, I should have brought some pictures. Um, on these radio law and 
and there's a, there's, a, there's a history of kind of artistic and kind of scientific work on the mechanics or the kind of the informational structure of growth and form. Dar Darcy Thompson's work uh, and people now doing this with artificial intelligence and computer modeling and so on. All of this, so it's, it's an interesting kind of conjuncture and there's a way in which suddenly the kind of inherent, the, 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 the dynamic aesthetic kind of um, generativity of nature that Heckel describes is actually being kind of uh, replicated uh, in, in scientific ways that are that are quite that are quite stunning and quite compelling. Um, uh, not everybody sees it this way. Some people find Heckel's aesthetic work didactic, but I think the, the point is that he thinks that nature itself is, in some sense, both aesthetic and didactic in the form of a of a good German uh, uh, pedagogy of the nineteenth century. Yeah. Does Heckel's biogenetic law answer my grandchild's question, how did I know that I was supposed to become a human being and not a dinosaur or a worm? Yes. <laughs> I'll tell him. <laughs> Ariel Hesayon, welcome up on the stage. Nice to have you here. That's Thank my introduction. You. There have been few more polarizing figures in early modern religious history than Jacob Burma. He has been regarded as a divinely illuminated genius by his most devoted disciples. Indeed, as the greatest and most famous of all theosophists in the world, the father of German philosophy, and by no less a figure than the cultural critic Walter Benjamin, as one of the greatest allegorists. Yet Burma has also been reviled in equal measure by his fiercest critics as an incomprehensible, ignorant heretic. According to the reckoning of his first biographer, Burma was the author of 30 works, many of which are extremely long and difficult. And these were all written in German, although several have Latin titles. In addition, Burma's extensive correspondence survives for the period from January 1618 to June 1624. A Lutheran by birth, by formative religious instruction, and steadfastly at his death, Burma's major theological concerns were the nature of creation and how it came into being, the origin and presence of evil, and the attainment of salvation for a process of inward spiritual regeneration and rebirth. Nonetheless, influenced initially by the teaching of Paracelsus, and the spiritual reformers Caspar Schwenkfeld and Valentin Weigel, as well as by popular alchemical and astrological texts, and then following the clandestine circulation of his first incomplete book, the famous Aurora in manuscript, a widening social network of friends, learned correspondents and noble patrons, Burma began developing certain heretical views that were furiously, furiously denounced by a local clergyman. These included his understanding of the Trinity, which he was accused of denying through the introduction of a fourth person, Sophia, or divine virgin wisdom, together with his explanations for the fall of Lucifer and the rebel angels. Adam's prelapsarian androgynous nature, the existence of seven qualities, dry, sweet, bitter, fire, love, sound, and corpus, and the three principles which corresponded to the dark world, light world, and our temporal visible world. Moreover, Having settled and established himself as a shoemaker at Gerlitz in Upper Lusatia and writing against a backdrop of vibrant scientific, astronomical and medical inquiry, damaging regional political struggles, religious polemic, apocalyptic speculation and, from 1618, the earliest phase of the Thirty Years' War, Burma interposed himself, ignorantly and presumptuously, according to his better educated critics, in important doctrinal debates over the nature of free will and the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper by expounding an ironic, anti-clerical message. This culminated in his announcement of an impending great reformation, a new age of love, patience and joy. For Burma's detractors within the Holy Roman Empire, it was incredible that a supposedly illiterate common man could have such a profound and extraordinary knowledge of God and nature. Clearly, what was at stake for them was an unwelcome plebeian challenge to scholastic learning, doctrinal orthodoxy, and the jealously guarded clerical monopoly of biblical interpretation. Accordingly, 
In this struggle for interpretive mastery, they attempted to weaken a pronounced hagiographic tendency that praised Burma as the pre blessed recipient of divine illumination. And they did this through charges of arrogance, ignorance, heresy, and presumption, not to mention irrationality, and for those who've read Burma, incomprehensibility. A few months before his premature death in November 1624, Burma prophesied that although his writings would be discarded by his fellow clergymen, countrymen, foreign nations would joyfully take them up. This prediction was largely borne out during the 17th century, as Burma's works were vilified and cast away in his homeland, but painstakingly published in Dutch and English translations. Indeed, as we shall see, between 1645 and 1662, most of Burma's treatises and the majority of his letters were printed in English translation at London. Moreover, I'm going to get this wrong, Morgan Chluid <laughs> of Gwynef rendered two shorter pieces from English into Welsh in 1655. Among Burma's followers, there circulated a garbled story that Charles I of England had been the main patron of this venture before his execution in January 1649. Some also maintained, I think correctly, that after the restoration of the Stuart monarchy in May 1660, the remaining works were brought out under the patronage of the 5th Earl of Pembroke. The important thing is that in their eyes, this tradition of royal and aristocratic support gave the undertaking prestige. Yet, as I've shown elsewhere in great detail, it simplifies developments, obscuring the involvement of a number of people with common aims. For actually, there were three overlapping phases. During the first phase from Burma's death until the outbreak of the English Civil War in August 1642, not a word of Burma was translated from German into English. Unsurprisingly, therefore, English speakers interested in Burma's writings were, with one known exception, foreigners, immigrants, or those who had travelled abroad. As might be expected, these people were not monolingual, but usually had command of Latin and sometimes German and Dutch as well. During the second phase, that is from 1643 onwards, English manuscript translations were made from German versions of Germ Burma's works printed at Amsterdam. These anonymous English translations circulated privately in much the same way as did other mystical, spiritual and prophetic writings during the period. Indeed, several examples survive of Burma's writings in manuscript, notably the way to Christ and his latter part of his Mysterium Magnum. Comparing the manuscripts indicates that despite some variations, these translations were done by the same person, but copied by different scribal hands. There's some more examples. As for the translator, this was John Sparrow, an Essex-born, Cambridge-educated lawyer, treasurer, collector of prize goods, diarist, as you can see on the right-hand side, polyglot and polymath. Sparrow regarded Burma's difficult texts as both a pathway for individual salvation and as a balm to heal the nation's wounds. Furthermore, he hoped that an assortment of powerful military and governmental figures with whom he was actually closely connected would use their influence to advance his goal of religious toleration. During the third and final phase, there was an organised scheme for publishing the extant corpus. I've deliberately given the theme of the conference on the left-hand side, picked Burma from Carl Jung's collection. <laughs> Sparrow was helped in this endeavour by his cousin, John Elliston, and a circle around the Prussian émigré, Samuel Hartlib, who seems to have financed much of the venture, the circle, and to have acquired all the books from Amsterdam. And the reason was they shared a similar goal, a vision of universal reformation influenced by the Moravian pedagogue, Jan Amos Comenius. Moreover, Burma's principal English translators hoped that their efforts would be rewarded with the settlement of religious controversies and the disappearance of sects and heresies. It was, however, to prove a vain hope. Instead of the promised day of Pentecost, when the true sense and meaning of all languages would be re revealed and united into one tongue, there was a new Babel. Instead of doctrinal uniformity, there was discord. Indeed, Burma's res readers responded in largely unforeseen ways sometimes with enthusiasm, but on other occasions with exasperation, ambivalence, and even revulsion. A handful were convicted of blasphemy, others formed spiritual communities, and others still fulminated against what they regarded as Burma's incomprehensible nonsense and vile falsehoods. <laughs> 
All the same, engagement with Burma's teachings was more extensive at this moment, crucial moment in English history than has usually been recognised. Nor was his influence either straightforward or always easy to untangle from the wider tradition of continental, mystical, prophetic and visionary writing that he epitomised. In short, although the essential narrative of the English Revolution of 1641 to 1660 would have been the same whether or not Burma's writings had been translated, a focus on political and military developments would be to misplace the key to his significance. Rather, Burma's influence in mid-17th century England can be seen in alchemical experimentation and attempts to create universal medicines within the laboratory, in almanacs and astrological predictions, in mystical thought, notably speculation about the creation of the universe, the nature of angels and the fall of Adam, in the literary expression of prophetic experience, in the development of heretical doctrines about God's presence within all living things. I've avoided the word pantheism because it's anachronistic at this point. The nature of the soul and the denial of an external heaven and hell, and spiritual contemplation and psychological comfort from melancholic temptations such as suicide, in utopian literature for his vision of a new age, in the enrichment of the English language for the introduction of neologisms, and in attempts to regulate sexual conduct for the imposition of celibacy. Afterwards, there was notable interest in Burma's writings amongst the Cambridge Platonists, a loose intellectual circle characterised by their readings of Plato, Plotinus and other ancient philosophers, among them Ralph Cudworth, Peter Sterry and the famous Henry Moore. Henry Moore, amongst the Cambridge Platonists, engaged at greatest length with Burma, writing a critique of Teutonic philosophy round about 1670 for his heroine pupil, most likely Anne Viscountess Conway, shown on the right. Moore regarded Burma as a holy and good man, who could not avoid becoming an enthusiast, the loaded word derived ultimately from Luther. Nor a man who could help being infallibly and constantly inspired. In short, a humble man given a great vision, but a misguided one who needed to be corrected and whose meaning could be salvaged. Turning to the Quakers, I've suggested elsewhere that their, both their engagement with Burma's writings and their, their association in contemporaries' minds with his teachings was more extensive than has hitherto usually been acknowledged. Indeed, it is noteworthy that several of Burma's Quaker readers became apostates or schismatics. Some were active outside England and others still were foreigners. Ultimately, though, the reasons for why so many who first became convinced of Quakerism turned away from the so-called Teutonic philosopher, as they did from other authors too, seems clear. The marginalisation of dissenting voices within the community, doctrinal differences, a preference for silence meetings, and plain style over abstruse notions. Finally, a few words about Jane Lead, a reader of Burma, a woman, and one of the most prolific published female authors of the long 18th century. Besides being the author of extensive spiritual diaries, theological treatises, epistles and some verse, during the last decade of her 80-year life, Leed became the centre of an extensive correspondence network stretching from, Pen stretching from Pennsylvania to the electorate of Saxony. Yet as her son-in-law and amantuensis conceded, outside of a small community of believers, Leed's writings were largely ignored in her own country. Instead, they enjoyed a widespread, if mixed, continental reception among an audience of assorted spiritualists, feminists, and pietists, and, given our conversations earlier, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz as well. Led was positioned at the forefront of the Philadelphian Society, who took their name from one of the churches in Asia Minor, mentioned in the Book of Revelation, a little band of millenarian supporters who believed erroneously that the world would end in August 1697. They had a coordinated publicity campaign which had the impact of shattering the community because most of them wanted, in fact, peace and obscurity rather than notoriety. Following Led's death, the Philadelphia movement would be reborn, reinvigorated by the arrival of the French prophets or camisards at London in 1706. But that too would ultimately end with personality clashes, dissension, fragmentation, disappointment, ridicule and failure.
There is, of course, much more to say. There's an 18th century reception. I could bring in William Law, John Byram, Freemasonry and the Occult, Swedenborgian milieu, William Blake, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Thomas de Quincey. That's just amongst English speakers. North America, I could go to Ralph Emerson, or we could go to Hegel. But as they say, that is a story for another day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. It's Thank you. fascinating that this mystic who lived for more than three centuries ago still has something to tell us. I'm thinking, will someone in 2623 have, will, be, will someone be remembered in 300 years here at Engelsberg, I wonder. So what is it, what is it that, that, what zeitgeist is it that makes Burma so interesting? Um, it's a great question. And I'll, I'll pick up the word that was used at the introduction to this meeting, which was the idea of the picnic. Sigmund Freud is another reader of Burma. And Freud, in his book on the joke, said that um, Burma is like a picnic. Every reader can bring their own meaning to the table. And I think that's the appeal of Burma, that it's, to quote another critic of Burma, Burma is difficult. And People feel that they can impose and read their own meanings into Burma, privilege certain interpretations, and almost see it as a key for unlocking meaning in the universe about the nature of creation and about the nature of salvation. So I think that is where the mystique lies. And then you have different traditions of interpretation, some of which, in fact, run contrary to what Burma says, but nonetheless, he inspires the endeavour. Uh, what did he say on the nature of creation? Because... That is a quite controversial topic today. Yeah. Uh, it's a difficult one to answer because he contradicts himself quite a lot. And the early Burma is not the same as the later Burma. Um, the key ideas are essentially creation out of nothing, which has sometimes been li likened to a Kabbalistic ensof, and also the idea of two falls. The idea of the first fall and then into matter, and then the idea of a second fall into a division, into one in the biblical account. So there is a great deal of play, particularly in the first book in Aurora, about the nature of Lucifer and the angels. And, but then he revises all of it. So that, that would be, I say, a, a quick summary. Thank you. <laughs> if, you if you had lunch with Jakob Burma, what questions would you put to him? My first question would be, why, would, why did you write what you wrote? <laughs> it's a long lunch, isn't it? It's a very long lunch, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So now I'm introducing both the towering figure of Carl Gustav Jung and the towering figure of Paul Bishop. <laughs> Not to be confused, no. Aniela Yaffe has an account of an evening at Aeronos. She says, There was a great deal of merriment and noise, and although no music invited to the dance, the merrymaking resounded far over the lake. Neighbours far and wide sent messages to Mrs. Ferber complaining. Jung was slightly tipsy, so were all the others, rather more so than less. Jung was thoroughly enjoying himself, encouraging those who were still too sober to pay due homage to Dionysus. He was here, there, everywhere, bubbling over with wit, mockery, and drunken spirit. <laughs> the epithet describing us as menads was coined incidentally that night. Mm. Eronoth, what's not to like? And in addition to that kind of anecdote, there's been, as has been mentioned, scholarship done. Uh, uh, Wasserst uh, uh, Stephen Wasserstrom, Riccardo Bernardini, Hans Thomas Harkel. Um, and as an intellectual project, one of the roots is obviously Jung. Uh, and so I want to kind of approach Jung through the figures of uh, Goethe and Nietzsche and, and try and link it back to Eronos. That's the plan. Uh, the affinities between... Um, Jung and Nietzsche to begin with and then Goethe are signalled in various ways in Memory of Jim's uh, reflections. He tells us that Nietzsche had been on the programme for some time 
but that he was held back by a secret fear that I might perhaps be like him, he says. Notion of secret, very important in memory of dreams of factions, and then we'll come back to it. A fear which, in regard to the secret, had, in, had isolated him from his environment. And he points out that, like Jung himself, Nietzsche was the son of a clergyman. In fact, in his seminar on Zarathustra, Jung frequently reminded the audience about this connection. He says, you've got to remember, Nietzsche was the son of a parson like me, and I know what that means. Of course, what does it mean? Maybe not entirely clear. Second, in relation to Goethe, in Memory's Dreams Reflections, Jung goes one step further. Um, not saying that he might have been like Goethe, but he would actually have been related to him. He talks about this legendary kinship with Goethe and an annoying tradition that my grandfather, he says, was a natural son of Goethe. Goethe, therefore, the great-grandfather. A story that was so annoying that Jung kept on mentioning it time and again to people. With, Agnelli Jaffe again says, a certain gratified amusement. I think so key, Jung, great guy for jokes, I think, and, and that's really important we remember that with him. He even drops a reference into the, uh, to this kinship in the correspondence with Freud. Just shows how fun-loving he was. Um, he relates it to his encounter with Goethe and encounter with Faust, that he says he was told to read by his mother, always significant. And he says that the real problem of Faust lay with Mephistopheles and even more so lay in relationship to the mystery of the mothers. And these references to Nietzsche and Goethe, we might say, offer two key pillars of an interpretive matrix within which we can approach the project of analytical psychology as a whole, and I hope in particular its connection uh, with Eranos. In Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche indexes his own philosophical project to what he describes as something that was no mere German, but a European event. More precisely, he says, a magnificent attempt to overcome the 18th century by means of a return to nature, by means of an ascent to the naturalness of the Renaissance, a kind of self-overcoming on the part of the century in question. And he goes on to sketch the portrait of an individual which he believes instantiates this event. He says that this individual bore the strongest instincts of the century in its breast, its sentimentality, difficult to translate, Gefühlsamkeit, its ability to feel, its idolatry of nature, worship of nature, we might say, its anti-historic, idealistic, unreal and revolutionary spirit, he says, the latter only being a form of the unreal. Now, we can translate, I think, these terms in some respects into what Jung himself was trying to do, its inheritance of idealism to begin with, its anti-historicism in the sense, that is, of an emphasis on the persistence of the archaic. It's unrealism in the sense of his opposition to what is guided as realistic, I was just going along with the flow. And um, analytical psychology has important affinities with areas which will connect with so many of what the other speakers are talking about today. Phenomenology, existentialism, vitalism, even philosophy, we're talking about Heckel already, and postmodernism maybe as, as well. Um, we can also see Jung as drawing on a number of traditions. We've already talked upon these, a number of disciplines in the academic sense. First of all, at history. Jung tells us how he's interested in everything Egyptian and Babylonian. Um, that he draws the disciplines of science. We've seen that in our discussion again of, uh, of, of Heckel. Um, that wonderful dream of the giant Radiolarian. Um, he draws on antiquity, reflected in his remarkable knowledge of world mythology. Um, and again, to mention a name, was already caught up, Spinoza. Spinoza has this idea of the internal in me, and I think that Jung is very heavily influenced by this idea as well. Finally then, sense of psychotherapy as a form of engagement with the world. And in the first of those dreams that we were looking at earlier, uh, it confirms Jung's denial, he says, to get to know nature the world in which we lived, and the things around us. What a fabulous program. 
Then to this individual that Nietzsche is talking about. This individual, he says, had something to which he aspired, and that was totality. Something that was opposed to the sundering of reason, sensuality, feeling and will, as preached with the most repulsive scholasticism, he says, by Kant, his antipodes. This figure, says Nietzsche, disciplined himself into a harmonious whole. He created himself. And we find here this word so central, I think, to Jung's thought, totalität. And unfortunately, a problem which I think is often, that this term is often misunderstood as being totalitarianism, that, that's what Jung's opponents will have you believe about him. I just briefly want to concentrate on the fact that there are these, these four capacities, these four faculties that Nietzsche is talking about. Reason, Vernunft, Sinnlichkeit, sensuousness, feeling, Gefühl, there it is again, and Villa. And, and to suggest, even if they don't map exactly onto those four psychic functions uh, that Jung talks about in his work on psychological types, nevertheless, there is a kind of correspondence that's, uh, that's there. The important thing is that these, these categories, it's not the mapping of them neatly onto uh, one onto one, but it is the inclusion of something which is non-rational, not irrational, but non-rational, with something that's rational, and that these, all of these things are going to be harmonised and pulled together into a whole. And I think this idea of disciplining oneself, turning oneself into a whole, is a reworking of, we had Plotinus mentioned just uh, a moment ago, uh, this wonderful idea that we find in Plotinus' is on beauty, this notion of self-sculpting. Plotinus urges us, withdraw into yourself and look. And if you do not find yourself beautiful yet, act as does the creator of a statue that is to be made beautiful. He cuts away here, smooths there, makes this line lighter, the other purer, until a lovely face has grown upon his work. So you should also do Cut away all that is excessive. Straighten all that is crooked. Bring light to all that is overcast. Labour to make all one glow of beauty. Never cease chiselling your statue until there shall shine out from you on that godlike splendour of virtue. I think that every day I'm going to work when I'm doing the commute. Okay? Will, we, will we do it today? Probably not. The individual then is, going, is, is engaged on an existential, on a psychological, but also a very real project. You know? It is about creating something uh, out of oneself. And we also find um, in the, this passage of Nietzsche key ideas that Jung picks up as well. The avoidance of Einseitigkeit or one-sidedness. This balance that we have to maintain between the rational and the non-rational. The sense of the individual as something that organises and synthesises their capacities and thereby turns them into something qualitatively higher and new. An ethics of the individual which is, in this sense, beyond good and evil. Um, Nietzsche goes on to talk about such a spirit becoming free and appearing in the middle of a universe with a feeling of cheerful and confident fatalism, he believes that only individual things are bad and that the ho as a whole the universe justifies and affirms itself. He no longer denies. Such a faith, he says, is the highest of all faiths. I have christened it with the name Dionysus. And this individual might sound that Nietzsche has been describing, might sound uncannily like the one described by Goethe, in his essay on Winkelmann, where he says, when the healthy nature of an individual functions as a totality, when he feels himself in the world as in a vast, beautiful, worthy and valued whole, when a harmonious sense of well-being affords him pure and free delight, then the universe, if it were capable of sensation, would exult at having reached its goal and marvel at the culmination of his own development and being. For what's the use of all the expenditure of suns and planets and moons, stars and galaxies, comets and nebulae, if at the end a happy individual does not unconsciously rejoice in existence? And it's not surprising 
that there's this echo, because the individual who's being described by Nietzsche is, of course, as you'll have guessed, Goethe, Goethe himself. Goethe, who is, one might say, a kind of instantiation of a Dionysian self, a self that is, like Dionysus, torn to pieces, but then reconstituted and returning at a higher, at a higher level. A replacement then for a god that has, since Spinoza, Goethe and Nietzsche been regarded as dead, and yet perhaps a god which is, if we're to believe the words of Basilides in the first of his sermons of the dead in the Red Book, not dead, but as alive as ever. Now, I think there's much one could say about the Red Book in terms of its scope and stylistics that reveals the influence of, um, of Goethe and of Nietzsche. But I want to concentrate on one particular aspect, which was originally there before this Red Book came out, which was to say its secrecy. Right? We knew it was there, but we, you know, within a little bit of it, we didn't know what it was like as a, as a whole. And we might see this as part of a strategy that Jung also learned from Nietzsche, namely not to speak naively and incautiously about one's ariton. Okay. This term for the unspeakable, the, the unutterable, the unsayable in the ancient Greek myths. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung describes himself as having been cleverer than Nietzsche inasmuch as he'd quickly noticed that to speak the unspeakable could lead to trouble. Like the educated Philistines, Bildungsphilister, which tragicomically he Christi criticised, Nietzsche, said Jung, did not understand himself when he fell into the mystery, into the mysterium, the term used by Jung in his Red Book, and into the unspeakable, das Nichtsuzagende. And when he wanted to sing its praises, that is, of the mysterium or of the unspeakable, he wanted to sing its praises to the crowd that had been forsaken by all the gods. Later, in his chapter on travels, where he gives an account of his visit to the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico, Jung notices the utmost secrecy with which the Pueblo people guard their religious practices, which reminds him of the ancient Greeks. In other words, it reminds him of, of Ariton again. The strange situation where the air was filled with a secret gave Jung, so he said, a sense of what it must have been to be like a Eloises, the site of arguably the most famous of the ancient mystery cults, the Eleusinia, celebrated in honour of the goddesses Demeter and Persephone. When Pausanias or Herodotus says that he is not permitted to name the name of a god, Jung says, I now understand why. It's not mystification, but the preservation of a vital mystery. And this then, it seems to me, is at least one of the many significances of the Eros conferences, that by providing Jung with a form present, presenting many of his own lectures, they enabled him to develop the project of analytical psychology. A project which, to be sure, is indebted to many intellectual sources and cultural traditions, as has already begun to become clear in our session today, but of which it could be said, I'd like to think, that it was also born out of the spirit of 18th century German classicism and out of the aesthetics of, of Friedrich Nietzsche. And so there's a, I like this picture here because it's kind of, you know, Jung gesturing towards us and, you know, that's the question, what is Jung? Okay, scientist, savant, cultural critic, okay, prophet, seer, all of those, a little bit, all of those things at the same time. But it seems to me that, and it ties in perhaps with a long-term struggle within the Eronos community itself about whether its work should be mystical or scholarly, whether it should be esoteric or academic, metaphysical or intellectual. Perhaps we want to ask ourselves whether the Eronos conferences could themselves be understood as a living revival of the mysteries of Eleusis and other mysteries or a mere archaeological recovery of those mysteries. In other words, is there an ariton of Eronos? And if so, what is it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Would Jung say that today's world is a better place than when he was around? I guess, I guess it, that would depend whether you ask 
the, the young Jung or the older one? I think the older one has a pessimism that would reluctantly say no. Mm. And that would, in fact, have a, have, see the world as having become a very dark place. My goodness, if Jung thought it was dark, now, several decades on and in our new millennium, how much darker yet? Mm. You touched upon it, but how much of, of Jung's impact was due to his personality? I think an incredible amount. I think a huge amount. And um, I've been reminded of that recently by um, uh, reading the... Uh, lectures that have been uh, that have been published that are coming out in Princeton University Press, um, and in in particular the ones on the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, and you really get the sense there of what a great communicator uh, uh, Jung was. His sense of humour, he, he, he was he was able to play the crowd in a really in a really good way. And I think one could say that wherever Jung gave a lecture, it was always going to be a really good gig. Mm. <laughs> After the formal conference at Ernos, he was sitting on the wall mm. and attracted the interest, especially of women. Mm. Yeah. Yes. That's you, not, that's we're just envious, aren't we? That, well, I think, well, <laughs> speak for yourself, but I mean, no, no, I don't know. I, no. I'm not going to be lured into the topic of Jung, Jung and gender, because that really is, that really, that, that's, that, that's a quite critical one and crucial that we get it, that we get it right. We don't maybe have, have time to do it now. But I, I noticed that it's Yaffe herself who, who says this term menad um, came, in, came in at that, at that time. And so I think my suggestion would be we have to look at it two ways. It's, it's Jung and the women, but it's also the women and Jung.